attending the IOMA webinar today. Um, so our topic as such is health versus wealth and the impact, the obvious impact at the moment in COVID-19 and beyond that after we uh, move out of COVID-19. So just as a, as a quick introduction uh, before I introduce the panelists, um, IOMA is a neutral resource concerned with future trends in the global um, consumer commerce and the impacts of evolving disruptive technologies. And it's a network of individuals and companies who wish to make a difference. And so um, today we brought together a distinguished panel um, who have considerable business, financial, economic, political and technological experience. And in that context, um, we'd like to understand a little bit better in the time permitting, um, basically where we are today with COVID-19, but specifically look forward um, in a positive lens to um, the, the impact, not, not least uh, in the future on health and wealth, but the impact moving forwards um, in general terms. So it's certainly going beyond the normal remit of Ioma around global consumer commerce, although we acknowledge um, this virus has impacted so many different things, including global commerce. So I'm gonna introduce first the, the three panelists um, and basically, then I'll uh, just lead into the first question and we'll, as, as David said, we'll have some questions from the attendees today as well to address. So um, firstly, I'd like to introduce um, Kurt, if I may, and just quickly a shout out uh, and appreciate, appreciate very much uh, that Kurt is here today. He's had a, a, a recent um, operation, um, which means he's got slightly unusual Austrian headgear on today. Over to you, Kurt. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot and thanks for inviting me. Uh, my name is uh, Kurt Bayer. I sit here in Vienna. Um, I worked for 25 years in applied economics research in Austria. Uh, when Austria joined the European Union, I went over and uh, became kind of the economic policy advisor uh, to the Minister of Finance dealing with Austrian economic policy questions and also European Union policy questions. I did that for essentially 12 years and then went to the World Bank. I was a board director for Austria and nine other countries at the World Bank in Washington, D.C. And then later on, uh, from 2008 until 2013, I was a board director at the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development in London. At the present time, I am a freelance consultant. I'm attached to some research institutes and I certainly appreciate uh, participating in discussions like today's. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Um, so next, I'll just turn to Bob, please. Thank you. Thanks very much, Richard. <clears throat> um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Bob Young. Uh, my background is that I, I graduated from uh, Oxford University in the 1960s uh, with a degree in modern languages, although during most of my working life, I've practiced economics in, in one form or another. Um, I spent my first 20 years or so of working life in private sector manufacturing, uh, most notably with Rolls-Royce and then with Vickers. Uh, and then for the final 25 years of my career, I was a consultant, starting with um, Coopers and Librand and finishing with a rather smaller firm, Europe Economics. Now, my interest in consultancy were in the economics of competition and uh, regulation. Uh, and, and through this mix of uh, things that I've done, I've had quite a lot of experience of public sector organisations, uh, not only as customers of the companies I worked for in the first half of my career, but also as a participant. And I served uh, two years in central government, uh, most of it in the number 10 policy unit under Margaret Thatcher. Then after that, I, I worked part time for six years with the Monopolies and Mergers Commission, which is now the Competition and Markets Authority. <clears throat> and then I did 10 years with the uh, Fulbright Commission, which deals with bright students toing and froing between the UK and the United States. Um, during my time in consultancy, I did um, quite substantial amounts of work for the European Commission and the European Parliament. And I also acquired um, quite a wide sectoral experience as well. I like to make people laugh saying that I have covered uh, the gamut from uh, Turkish chewing gum uh, through to Chinese manhole covers, done all of those. So overall, I think I've seen the world of industry from the inside out and from the outside in. And I noticed that um, in the IOMA biog uh, that went out, my, uh, I should say my own cultural interests are not 
confined to steam railways. I, I'm with Kurt. Uh, I, I am a music lover and the great cultural loves of my life are Mozart, Beethoven and Schubert. They're not mm -hmm. all on the footplate. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Bob. We could almost have an hour about you, I think, in the future, but we'll see. Um, <laughs> so uh, now, just quickly over to uh, Roger. That's great. Thank you. Hi, um, I, uh, Roger Willison Gray. Um, I'm uh, the Corporate Affairs Director for IORMA, amongst other things. I've spent um, over 30 years working in the technical uh, technology sector seen lots of technologies come and go um, and latterly been most uh, involved in digital transformation uh, of, of businesses both large and uh, small um, enabling companies to uh, try and predict the future a little bit and to be able to uh, disrupt rather than be disrupted. Um, I hope um, that the current crisis will act as a catalyst for change and will allow us to accelerate some of the many technologies that have got great potential but perhaps haven't been used to their best effect. Absolutely, thank you, thanks Roger. Um, so let me just um, give a little bit more to the, uh, the topic of the day and then lead on with questions if I may. Um, so I, I encourage the attendees to, to pose questions as we speak now so we can uh, cherry pick if you like some final questions at the end um so um one general principle for today although the um the impact of covid19 of course is immense across many different levels of society um we wanted to, this to be not so much looking at the here and now the daily stats if you like uh, but more a longer term view on the sort of on a, with, certainly with a positive lens um on, on, on what the impact might be and what the positive things have been so far uh, as we look at the, uh, the pandemic. Um, and, and, and what I'd like to do is the first establish that the decisions taken almost universally in the last few weeks and months um, to overcome this pandemic will have significant ramifications. Um, we know that um, uh, we have uh, current extraordinary circumstances and we are changing, therefore, some long established <coughs> norms. Um, so we have, for instance, unprecedented national debt. Uh, we have a, a faster acceleration and uptake of newer technologies. We, we have potentially uh, a, a new, if you like, um, way to look at um, how it, climate change might change uh, with the um, significant reduction in, in uh, transportation, for instance. Um, and we have potentially new world orders coming out of this and even generational tensions uh, where some of these factors are changing as a result of this virus. And so um, whilst you know, we're not out of it yet um, and things will continue to change, um, I want to have a slightly longer term view, particularly given the sort of eminence of our panelists today. And, um, and, and uh, you know, coming back again to an earlier point, um, there have been so many diverse and positive messages and of, of, of what people have done as individuals, working in the community, working nationally, working internationally, and you know, many great stories of collaboration. So I want this very much to be more of a positive thing, even though we're in the middle of it at the moment. Um, so thank you once again for joining this discussion. Um, it will set the scene for IOMA to do a, a, some future discussions concentrating perhaps on one or more of the key topics or one or more of the key disruptive technologies as well. Um, and um, so I will move soon to ask the panel on, on their views on particular questions. Um, but I think just going back to this health versus wealth, um, of course, we only have an hour. Uh, we can't cover every potential uh, point of view and opinion and question. Um, but I, I will put it out there that um, there's always been, of course, a very delicate balance to be had between health and wealth. Um, and um, whilst it's difficult sometimes to calibrate or, or achieve a fair balance, is it truly possible to get the best of both worlds? Uh, you know, I'm uh, an optimist. I believe we can get a fair equilibrium here. Um, um, and I think the other thought before we lead into questions is, you know, are we really at a major turning point? 
um, or will the world almost go back to normal once we can open up our shops and travel again and so on? I think, uh, you know, it feels like we're at a significant changing point, um, but yeah, we don't know yet. We're not there yet. Um, so um, I'd like it to be positive. I'd like us to pose some interesting thoughts here, but we can take it on further. I certainly hope that this time is used as a way that we can learn our lessons. I think we will get another pandemic whenever that is in the future, once we've seen the back of this one. And I, and I encourage debate everywhere um, to basically encourage our leaders to think differently and to be bold in the way that they can uh, improve our world. So thank you very much. And I will pass on now to ask my first question. Um, how do you envisage the return of, uh, will be from COVID-19? And what form will it take? I'll ask that question first to Bob, if I may. To me, all right, uh, thanks, uh, Richard. Well, in my view, um, we have to keep health above wealth. I know that uh, there is a trade-off between the two, conflict between the two, um, but it seems to me that if we are going to equate wealth, let's just say with economics and finance, well, <clears throat> economic damage, however difficult it might be, can in the long run, long run be repaired but dead bodies can't be revived and <coughs> excuse me it seems to me therefore that um, the the health has to come before the wealth and with that in mind it seems to me that social distancing is going to have to remain in place for months to come and rightly so i was looking at uh, material on the bbc news just at lunchtime and sure, saw there the, the startling effect on the, the R factor of the lockdown uh, as from March the 23rd. It, it was really very, very striking. So it seems to me that social distancing has achieved a lot and will continue uh, to do that. Um, so mass testing and very low R values will be required, in my view, before larger scale gatherings can even be contemplated, let alone allowed. Uh, if you ask me for something more specific, I envisage that there'll be a, a very, really very slow lifting of commercial restrictions, e.g. small shops allowed to reopen or some small shops allowed to reopen, but still with the social distancing in place and limited numbers of people allowed in at any one time. And this is pretty much what we've got at the moment. Um, it seems to me that perhaps cafes and restaurants could be open more widely on a takeaway basis only and only if the owners can afford it which i've mm. heard is not always the case um, i've also heard pleas and they seem reasonable to me in relation to garden centers where i think you can uh, observe social distancing in the nature of the the products they offer and, and, and the way in which they're presented and i think that would make a difference morale wise uh, as well as economically to those in the sector and garden centers are not not the only example at all but i do think we're probably a long way away and i hope we are in a way uh, from uh, open pubs hairdressers beauty salons or any other activity that requires um, close personal proximity Right. Um, I find it very hard to see the way forward for schools, um, maybe primary schools only and in limited numbers of classes uh, for some months to come. I find it much harder to see the way forward at the moment, at least for um, further education colleges and, and universities. Right. Uh, Thank you, Bob. I, I think um, um, I'll, I'll, that's great. Um, I, I, what I'll do, I mean, so you see quite a gradual lifting. Um, yes. I, maybe I could pose that same question to Kurt. You, you're a few weeks ahead, aren't you, in terms of, what well, I'm assuming so, in terms of your lockdown in, in Austria? Yes, I mean, um, I'd like to look at a little bit of a more macro view. Yep. Uh, first, let me refer to the title of our event, Health versus Wealth, seems to uh, you know, suggest some kind of a dichotomy. But of course, any economy will only be thriving with healthy people. You can't have most people sick or being afraid of being sick and run an economy. So it is a very delicate balance, of course. And I see sequ sequentially, of course, one has to take decisions where one might take precedence over the other. But essentially, going forward, we need to have healthy societies to get out of this. Now, we do know, and I think the estimates are IMF, that the costs, global costs of this pandemic are about 
nine to ten trillion dollars. That's about ten percent of GDP. So it's very very deep. Uh, and it is my contention, and not only mine. And I agree with Bob that to get out of this will be a very lengthy process. The people who say this is a very sharp downturn and like a V moving up again next year, I don't believe that. Many, many smaller businesses, bigger businesses will go out of business over this time. Many people will have lost their jobs, will have lost their skills. And it's very difficult, uh, I think, to, to revive that very quickly. Uh, just what, where could we go? Essentially, there are two, in my mind at least, two alternatives. One is to essentially try to establish the status quo ante of the economy, which is difficult enough, it'll take a long time, but I think this is not satisfactory. I think we should go not to a new normal, but to a better normal and use this unprecedented crisis and also the monies that have been committed so far and will be committed in the future to really try to build a better economy and society. And that means trying to uh, get rid of, if you want, in the future, some of the dysfunctionalities which have built up already before the crisis. We know we have a climate crisis. We know we have a crisis of increasing divergence uh, across the globe uh, within countries, income distribution. Uh, we know we have, uh, and we have learned all, I think that the idea that uh, the state should be as small as possible has been voided, essentially counteracted in this crisis because it's the state now who provides, which provides essentially the hospital beds and all these types of things. So yes. I think we can build a more socially inclusive and ecologically sustainable society, but of course it doesn't come by itself. It will take very, very strong political and if you want citizens effort to get to a better society in the future. Right, thank you, Kurt, great. So very briefly, I'll have to keep it fairly short for you, Roger, but I'd like you to just give a quick answer to, to that question. Um, what form will it take as we come out? Um, <clears throat> I think um, the political uh, governance is going to be one of the issues here. Uh, it's a very fine balance between the forces who are suggesting fairly reckless strategies, and there's been several in the, in the press over the last few days, and those who are advocating, uh, uh, as uh, my colleagues have just said, a, a longer term uh, uh, planned exit. And I think that we're seeing in some societies civil disorder. It's quite prominent in some states of America. We've been lucky in the UK, uh, but I believe fatigue is setting in and people are now um, wanting to uh, ease in, in the popular phrase the lockdown but there's also a generational issue 75% um, of the deaths in the UK are people over 60 and something like three quarters of those are male um, that makes me and, and anybody else in that category um, somewhat cautious about where I want to go um, but younger people are saying well we're not as affected by this we can we can uh, take the risks uh, and I can see there's some some logic in, in, in some of those arguments so the challenge for uh, government I think the social distancing is, is going to be enforcement uh, and influence in behavior because there's already a substantial number mm. of people who don't follow the guidelines and making perhaps more clarity for the rules uh, if we are going to allow things they need to be clearly allowed and it needs to be uh, something that, that all the authorities understand and, and work on consistently. I find tremendous variation in, in, in the UK environment at the moment. Um, so um, I believe there will be a return to some level of normality when testing can be more widespread. Um, I know there's a, a biotech company working on a 10 minute test at the moment. If that comes to fruition, then I could see biosecurity barriers coming up at entrance to buildings, restaurants, and so on. And if you test positive, you just won't be allowed in. Um, yeah. And I can see that as one, <clears throat> one way we could come out a bit quicker. Right, okay. Let's hope we can't use your technological uh, prowess to, to block people from your own birthday party and things, Roger, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> 
So anyway, um, thank you for that. It was uh, very, uh, you know, illuminating to get um, some great answers there. So just um, moving on now, maybe to more of a, a wealth uh, question. Uh, national governments, as we know, have built up huge levels of debt um, in an effort to fight this um, pandemic. Um, how is it going to be paid? Um, I, I think naturally I should ask Kurt that first question. Yeah, I mean, we have to see that I think uh, today our economies, uh, both the public sector and the private sector, have uh, loaded with very, very huge debts. I mean, the G7 countries, see the largest and most powerful countries in the world, uh, the governments have about 140% of GDP in debt levels, which is, you know, this is five times as much as it was about 20, 30 years ago. We also know that many, many companies are very highly leveraged and have a lot of debt. And of course, as a result of the last crisis, many of the private sector debts, especially from the banking sector, have been shifted over to the governments. So the governments are essentially uh, burdened with very high debt levels. Now, it is very clear that uh, if we want to get out of this crisis, this would require more money more debt probably. And many of the aid packages which the European Union but individual countries have seen so far require more debt uh, which the government will guarantee or the government will take on in favor of private consumers and the private sector. So uh, there's one thing I think which is quite clear to me that even uh, though we have very high debt levels, the debt levels will rise even more because we cannot have austerity after such a deep crisis. So after the health situation is halfway under control, governments will still have to undergo much more debt. Now, of course, somebody has to pay for it. How can we do that? Uh, of course, it, I think it would be, uh, I don't know, not very plausible to say that those sectors of the populations which suffer most economically from the crisis are the ones who have to pay the debts which have been incurred to fight the crisis. Uh, there is a certain amount of limit and I think Roger said it before that there is a lot of discontent also in society and we see also in French uh, banlieues is again a lot of civil unrest and in other countries too. So we have to make sure that uh, in the short run the debt burden will be spread more evenly we clearly have to get also those companies, multinational companies, that evade paying taxes in the countries where they generate wealth to also pay their share. But in the medium and longer run, uh, there is not really any capacity of the private sector, of citizens, of taxpayers to pay back that kind of a debt. And so mm. the only solution that exists is actually what the Bank of England has been doing now is that the national banks, the central banks, have to take over some of this debt and have to take it over and take it off the hands of the government and of the private sectors. I know that this is not a very popular uh, discussion because clearly this can be abused and so on. But if we want the economies, both the private sector enterprises and the government to be able to rebuild a better society and better economy, we have to start from a lower debt level than we have now. Thank you, thank you, Chris. It's not easy for sure, and I think that's something we can debate further, um, you know, in another session discussion. So, just briefly, Bob, what's your point of view on that? How do you think we can repay it? Okay. Uh, well, I suppose I should uh, begin by saying that my my views on uh, macroeconomics are not worth anything like as much as Kurtz. Most of my the economics work I've done has been at the the micro level, but uh, so I perhaps lack the experience and the imagination that Kurt has on the macro level. But it seems to me that um, how is the debt going to be paid back? Well, I think. Uh, by and large in the normal way of taxation and uh, restraint in public expenditure, but on a very grand scale. And interest rates are bound to rise, I think. And the difference this time round is, uh, I think, scale, not substance. Um, Kurt said that uh, we can't contemplate uh, another few years of austerity once this pandemic is, quote, over. 
Um, but my, my hunch, and it is no more than hunch, is that that's what we're going to have, uh, more years of austerity. It seems to me that um, a number of publicly funded projects will have to be paused or scaled back. I think HS2 uh, might become a victim of, of what we're going through. Um, and I guess also it would be a brave government that restrains funding for the National Health Service and, and for the, uh, the care sector as well. Um, so I can see that the funding there will need to rise, but by how much and then how much goes into um, wages of people who've given, <coughs> excuse me, so much during the pandemic as distinct from buildings, equipment and drugs. It's, it's very hard to see uh, what is going to survive unscathed, as it were, uh, by um, the repayment of the debt uh, uh, and the need to keep faith with the, the NHS and with the, the care sector. So I think we are in for a hard time in relation to areas such as welfare and defence and education. And that's not the end of the list. But that's, yes. my, that's my four penneth, Richard. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I think uh, undoubtedly it's, gonna, it's not an easy one to solve. Um, and we're not going to solve it all today, but I think the um, you know it's we have to brace ourselves to be, to be you know as we are being responsible in our um, way of staying at home. We have to be responsible in the way we come out of this, and and expect to pay a bit more as individuals and families. So what? Um, so just moving on now, um, more uh, more of a macro question this time. Um, that in, 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 uh, for 2020, there's been some widespread criticism of some of the sort of global organisations for falling short um, uh, and maybe even being manipulated a little bit by um, powerful forces. Um, do you think some of those, uh, without naming them per se, but uh, do you think those global institutions have a future? And if so, um, you know, how can they retain um, their independence, but also um, how can they be more effective in the future, uh, given that we will have another pandemic at some point? Um, so that question, sorry, um, maybe first to, to Roger, if I may. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, I think as far as, as globalisation is concerned, the, the genie is firmly out of the bottle. I can't see a return to uh, national centricity. Um, uh, global corporations are just that, global corporations. Um, and they take decisions based uh, on evidence. So um, I think we'll see the big players adapt and evolve uh, to the changing market conditions. The, the market in South Korea, um, for example, is nearly back to normal. So you might focus your trading activity in those areas where you can get the best returns. I think in terms of the, the underlying question about taxation and morality, um, I have actually been involved on a number of occasions bringing tech companies into the UK. And there's a tried and tested formula for uh, how you structure a US corporation uh, in Europe in terms of optimizing its uh, tax liabilities. The corporations don't create that environment, governments do. Um, and it's, it's a bit rich for ministers of whatever flavor to stand up and criticize uh, you know large tech for utilizing uh, the arrangements they provide for them um, if there's an issue with taxation it needs to be resolved by governments and, and the mm. appropriate um, international organizations to close the loopholes mm. so i don't see the tech industry reacting to that on its own no okay thank you um so that question again basically back to bob if i may Yes, thanks, uh, Richard. Um, I, I, I read the question before the webinar got going. I'm not quite sure what we mean by uh, powerful forces, and I, I won't speculate. The only thing that, that came into my head, and I have no idea whether this is uh, evidence-backed or not, is that I have read that the World, Ho World Health Organization is said to be in the pockets of the Chinese. Now, that's a terrible thing to say, and I don't know what evidence there is for that, or whether it's true. Um, but... I, I don't I don't get the impression that um, global organizations are being manipulated by powerful forces. If, if I could turn right. global into supranational, then at, at that level, uh, I think, for example, the EU doesn't come out well uh, in the present situation. Um, 
if you remember, uh, Ursula von der Leyen quite recently said that the EU owes Italy an apology for not coming to Italy's aid sooner. And what followed up from Ursula von der Leyen's um, comment about that? Absolutely nothing, a resounding silence. Um, I'm not quite sure what she had in mind uh, that would make up for the apology, but the fact is that the, the institution itself seems to me to have been um, well, absent, basically, from, from what is going on. Um, the World Bank and the IMF have been quite quiet as well, unless I've been reading the wrong newspapers. So my personal view is that really these supranational organisations like the EU will quite simply perpetuate themselves. They've done so for donkey's years. Um, they're, they're staffed by people who are very accomplished at keeping the organisation intact and to some extent expanding it as well. Um, so I, I have to say, um, I think the supranational organizations are going to resist any diminution or weakening of themselves. Um, and they may well dream up reasons, given the problems arising from the pandemic, uh, to enlarge or strengthen themselves. So to be honest, Richard, I, I'm not one bit optimistic about the, um, the, the supranational stroke global organizations. I think they'll carry on, not exactly as though nothing had happened, mm -hmm. but as though not enough had happened to make them change course. Right. Okay, but would you would you would you agree though that perhaps there haven't been to mention the two that you mentioned, they haven't been maybe as effective as they could have been. I mean, I mean this is obviously a very personal perception. Um, you know, one hopes that these people entrusted with so much responsibility can cut through a lot of levels and achieve um, you know um, the end result. But of course, in reality, the pandemic is incredibly hard. So it's not easy for anyone, any national government or pan, you know, supranational entity to, to solve all these problems. Yes. Yeah, so agree they haven't been effective. Yep. No. Well, I think, uh, Richard, that uh, what, what's actually happened is that um, action, influence, um, argument um, has just uh, devolved down to nation state level, that the supranationals for the moment are not exactly irrelevant, but they're, they're not active players. Germany does what Germany wants to do, the Brits do what the Brits want to do, and so on. Um, and I can't see that changing myself uh, until all this is over, whatever that means, but that, that's for some time to come. So I think what we're looking at is, is a, a resurgence, if you like, of national supremacy over the supranational uh, institutions. And the supranationals will just quite simply sit there quietly and then come bouncing back a bit like the virus, really, I suppose. After, shouldn't say that, after the national governments have, as it were, played all the cards in their hands. Right, and so, got it. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm going to move on now to the next question, which is around perhaps um, the, the, the simple fact, unfortunately, that we're likely to um, see another pandemic, whenever it is, you know, once we've gone, seen the back of this one. Um, um, so really, um, in terms of, if I take a step back, if I'm running a big business program, um, we'll have chances to have milestones, we'll have chances to have checkpoints, we'll have chances to have a lessons learned session, which is very open and transparent, to sort of try and learn from how we could have done things better. Um, and, and, and at the moment, you know, in the current pandemic, it, it seems um, irrefutable, well, irrefutable might be a bit strong, but, you know, the, the facts are still surfacing. So it seems very much that the pandemic came first out of China, um, as it did, um, which is certainly true for the SARS pandemic in roughly 2002-2004. Now, uh, they dealt, they've dealt with the COVID-19 very quickly, very effectively on the face of it, the Chinese have. Um, they've also shared their information, as, uh, as far as I can see from my layman's position, shared the information very quickly. Um, however, is there a, 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 um, a need for us to almost have a sort of collective international lessons learned that says maybe ask more questions? Why is it that we seem to be getting pandemics and why is it we don't seem to be getting um, those, uh, you know, maybe the, the surfacing of that fast enough while people are still traveling all over the world? Um, is there a way we can, I don't know, hold them to account? Um, and I'll ask that question then first to Kurt, if I may. 
Thank you. Uh, it's a difficult question. Of course, we all know, uh, and we, we read that in the textbooks, that global problems need global solutions. Uh, the way the all countries handled the, the coronavirus situation was first nationally. Maybe the World Health Organization uh, disseminated some information, but it certainly didn't have any executive power uh, to do anything. So, on the other hand, we do see that some of the Asian countries reacted much more forcefully and faster and decisively to COVID-19 than the Europeans did and the Americans did. So uh, there is obviously somebody and something that has learned something from previous uh, pandemics, SARS or MERS, and it seems that the Koreans and maybe Singapore, if so they have a recurrent situation, but also some of the other countries in China were better prepared and have been willing to learn the lessons. And maybe that's part of their political culture to be more prepared after they have a relatively severe crisis. It seems to me that in, in Europe, at least, uh, we don't seem to learn very much from the lessons. I have not, just as an example, I have observed the 2008 uh, financial crisis being in the EBRD in London, how it hit uh, the ex-communist countries. Uh, and also, of course, how it, how it hit the, the European countries. And there was never any kind of retrospective, any willing to learn the lessons, was our economic policy in Europe adequate or not? And it wasn't, because clearly the EU grew much slower and much less fast than the United States did after the 2008 crisis. But there is no willingness to look back and say, did we do the right thing in order to make it better next time? There is a fear, it seems politically induced, I think, to look back and say, maybe we could have done something better. Mm -hmm. That seems to be uh, something which today's politicians, at least the ones that I know and, and read about in the newspapers, don't seem to be willing to do. So my, uh, my, 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 my optimism that we will learn something from this crisis is very, very limited, especially also we do see, and that refers to the, to the previous question very quickly, uh, the, the power of global institutions uh, to have some kind of a global governance situation on certain issues has diminished quite a bit and we have reverted before the COVID crisis already to nationalism. I mean, if you right. see that, just, just one question, if you see that China, for instance, in the International Monetary Fund and in the World Bank has a share of 6% of the voting share and has tried to get its adequate share, it's the second largest economy in the world, the Europeans and the Americans have prevented that. So you have global institutions where many of the countries are not adequately represented and let alone, of course, least developed countries and the weak countries. So it seems to me that, uh, that I'm quite pessimistic that we get global uh, institutions. I also agree that the, the Bob's uh, criticism of the European Union in this situation is very bad, but we also have to realize all these institutions do what their member countries want them to do. The institutions yes. themselves have no executive power. They rely you know, on 28, 27, countries in the European Union, 192 countries in the World Bank and so on. So it's all their, their, their members and they really want to do their own thing. Thank you, Kurt. I mean, maybe maybe um, you know, it's a good thing in our digital age with social media and so on that whilst we have you know, that, that propensity to change slowly or maybe look in, not look in the mirror, reflect on how we could do things better, it, 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 maybe it's a good thing with social media as long as the information is correct that you know things can surface, um, you know, and and flag um, where public opinion is different or, or doesn't like the way we're heading. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, so just very quickly on on the same question um, to Bob, just to get your point of view on this, and then then we'll move on to maybe. Yeah. I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm worried it could get pessimistic here. I want to lift it and become more optimistic again. Fine. Well, I I don't have a lot to add anyway, Richard. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, but it does seem to me that, um, well, 
it seems likely, does it not, that the, the, the present coronavirus escaped, if that's the right way of putting it, either from um, the so-called wet markets in Wuhan, or possibly, and I've seen um, reference to this, uh, escaped from a Chinese virology lab. Don't know about the latter. But it does seem to me that perhaps what we ought to try to aim for is an independent inspection regime um, that could apply itself to any country that uh, appears to give rise to the risk of a serious virus outbreak. Uh, I'm not confining it to China, but it does seem to me that in the same way as we've tried weapons inspections in the past, and have got somewhere, but perhaps not as far as we would have liked, uh, that perhaps some um, viral or medical inspections in risk-prone mm. countries or in risk-prone activities in those countries could be established. That would be a significant breakthrough, it seems to me. It might be a, a worthwhile preventative uh, thing to do. Yes. Uh, whether in the case of China they would accept that kind of intervention, I am not sure, but um, I'm not optimistic either. I, I, I know you wanted to <laughs> I mean, just sound an optimistic yeah, okay. note, but I think the optimism might lie in the possibility that uh, one could develop across the world an independent inspection regime to try to forestall viral outbreaks again. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and I think just to surface the discussion is a positive thing, at least. Um, but thank you. Okay, so um, I'm just gonna, moving on slightly um, around uh, the agile digital economy and how maybe what's interesting if I take a step back, quite a few of the um, innovative and powerful ways we're tracking the virus or trying to um, you know, test, track and trace um, to allow us perhaps on, based on good data to move, uh, to move away from the lockdown is, is very technology related. So um, the question that we had was around, um, you know, the, the agile digital economy has in general been a winner, I think, in terms of the pandemic, if, if, if that phrase can be used. Um, do you think that um, public bodies and institutions could also be a little bit more agile in the way that they work? So what do I mean by that? I mean, you know, is it possible as we move forwards um, in our sort of better world um, concept that, that a, a large national or supranational um, organization can almost have a, an agile concept like test and scale fast, test and fail fast, to sort of, to, um, you know, to, to put the right policies in place quickly, or is that not really possible? So the question first, I think, to Roger, since you're, you're very much a, an, ag an, an agilist um, and a digitalist. Yeah, thank you. Um, I uh, have had quite a lot of experience over my career of, of public sector procurement uh, in defence and in health, <coughs> amongst others. Um, the nature of, of bureaucracy and uh, its obligation to defend the public purse and the public good means that it's almost impossible for those kind of organizations to become agile. I think they can adopt technology um, and, and in time they will. Uh, I had a situation where I, I was trying to contact uh, a local authority and they moved everybody out of the offices and they're all working from home and they've got some basic level of ability, but they can't transfer calls. So if you get through to somebody and they can't answer your question, you then have to find the direct line of somebody else. So just a simple example of not making use of the, of the kind of technology that most of us would take for granted, like using Skype, for example. Um, I think on a, on a, on a bigger picture, um, testing and, and scaling. I mean, when I was worked at IBM, they, they had a, a philosophy um, of basically that, start uh, quickly, grow um, when you're able to, and fail fast. Um, and, and that works in, in, in industry and commerce, but I don't think it works in, in the public sector. So the challenge mm. is gonna be, we, we are also, I think in the UK, governed by an economic view. Somebody on a call I was on this morning said that Britain's always been regarded as a good place to invest for dividends. 
So we're cautious, middle of the road, get a good return. We don't have the same ability to grow unicorns like the US economy does. And I think until our, our sort of macroeconomic climate changes in the UK, I don't think you'll see that uh, becoming an area that the public sector is willing to take risks on. Um, right. So I'm afraid we'll, we'll improve, but it will be an evolution, not a revolution. No, thank you. That's a nice answer. I mean, I think, um, yes, but they can at least embrace some of the technology as they are. But uh, yes, um, changing from a cultural point of view may not be um, appropriate or even practical. Yeah, okay. What, um, so just uh, briefly, uh, Bob, if you can help uh, sort of share some thoughts on that one. And then we'll yeah. sort of circulate for the final question and, and open up the questions to the, uh, to the audience. Thank you. Yes. Thanks, uh, uh, Richard. I, I would very much in agreement with something that Roger said there about um, procurement skills in the public sector. That seems to me, um, if you like, where a lot goes wrong, whether it's IT or in other respects as well. I mean, there have been some, um, some bad IT failures in the public sector. The, there was the passport hoo-ha of 1999. Universal credit is still a problem. Um, and I saw in the recently that um, no less than the, the British Army were very critical about the, the NHS's physical distribution systems for getting equipment round and about. Um, so it does seem to me, and it has for a long time, that there is, there is a problem with procurement skills generally um, in the public sector and that these are often related to IT systems as well. Um, it's not universal. There are some parts of the public sector that I've personal experience of that work very well with new IT systems. Um, one particular area I think that should bother all of us is um, court processes, um, which seem on the face of it perhaps to be susceptible to improvement through um, the use of IT. The, the Lord Chief Justice was quoted this morning as saying there was a backlog of 37,000 court cases even before the lockdown. Uh, getting through those is going to be quite a trial, never mind the additional burden that's building up while the, the, the lockdown is in place. So what do you do about raising the general standard of uh, procurement and foreseeing problems, if you like, in procurement in the public sector? And the honest answer to that is I don't know. Um, maybe business schools have something to offer. Uh, maybe um, secondment from uh, commercial organisations which uh, are good at uh, procurement uh, could be injected in some way in, into the public sector. When I was a, a lad in my early automotive career, it was reckoned that the, the best buyers in the business were people who trained at Ford. Now, I don't know whether that's still the case, um, but it seems to me that something like that, uh, uh, procurement expertise needs somehow to be injected into the public sector in fairly large measure and in, in, and in particular areas. Uh, perhaps then we would see a bit more agility through the proper adoption of good IT systems. Uh, it's a bit long-winded perhaps, but that's, that's, my, that's my view. That it's procurement. Yeah, thank you, thank you. I mean, uh, I think, yeah, the procurement is undoubtedly important to, to have the, the accountability, the framework and so on. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I think we, should, we certainly could explore that further from a global commerce point of view. So, um, so just to circulate now, we're, we're going to get some questions now from the, from the audience and, uh, and I'll do that quickly. I think just the final one, maybe just directed um, uh, just to Kurt. Um, was, we've seen some ex great examples of young and old coming together during the pandemic, where maybe volunteers have, uh, have stepped up and, and helped people most in need. Um, and, you know, down to specific individuals, one in the UK for anyone in the audience from the UK around, you know, Captain Tom and what an amazing uh, you know, role model he's become. Um, but um, uh, do you think um, that... The, the young and old have learned to um, um, work together better, Kurt, as a result of this pandemic. I, I don't know what your personal experience is, but you can answer, obviously answer this maybe slightly below your macro uh, level. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, it's not only young and old. I think the, the, the crisis has brought out that our societies are quite fragmented. There's country versus city, there's uh, south versus north in Europe. 
there's rich versus poor and so on. So there's a lot of fragilities. But what I think has been the positive example is that below the official surface of government regulated uh, situations, there has been a lot of coming together during this crisis. Mm -hmm. And to me, of course, that is the hopeful thing also for the future politics that we need essentially, need, we need the, the political process needs to rely much more on what is called civil society, organized civil society and non-organized civil society. Politicians are very often removed from everyday life. And it seems that there's a lot of know-how, there's a lot of willingness, there's a lot of engagement in the populations. And I think that's the positive way to go forward, to include much more and to be less afraid on the part of politicians of the mm. populations from whom, by whom they are, have been elected. Thank you, great. So to that point, I'll, I'll hand back to David, please, to ask maybe one or two questions, which anyone from the panel can sort of raise their hand and, and help answer. I know we're short on time. So what I will say is that we've, I know we've got quite a number of great questions. So thank you for raising them. We won't have a chance to ask them all. So we'll post them uh, uh, as a blog as we sort of complete this uh, webinar today. Um, so people can see what other questions were raised and maybe we can comment on them and keep the debate going a little bit um, outside of this webinar. Thank you, David, thank you. Yeah, okay, uh, we have some great questions. I'm afraid we won't be able to get through all of them, but um, as Richard said, we will be dealing with those in the blog after the event. I have a question here from Marek Bakker. Uh, if such massive amounts of money can be marshaled for the coronavirus crisis, why not for the crime, climate crisis, which is even more dangerous to help and indeed human survival? Kurt, stick his hand up for that. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, my big point has always been we should use what we do now to fight the corona crisis to at the same time nudge the economy and society into the climate crisis mode, fighting mode. I mean, there's a lot of money that goes to enterprises, a lot of money that goes to, to households. And of course, that money can be used, you know, for uh, whatever, uh, reconstructive purposes to do the same as before, or especially the investments that are being done can be used towards a greener economy. And I think one should not say we do first the one thing and then the other thing. Uh, we have to do these things more or less together. And that, of course, especially pertains to the money that goes to enterprises. Because clearly, uh, to help consumers who have lost their incomes now is just an uh, income maintenance type of thing that you cannot really direct towards a greener type of thing. But many of the investments that should be done should be done in a sustainable and ecologically responsible way. Okay, we have another question uh, from Steve Allen this time. This is to do with a new norm and the uh, impact or change of uh, use of technology. Uh, Steve says, given the new way of working, do you see stay at home, online meetings, et cetera, to be the new norm in the way that online retail boom that is happening at the moment? So ensuring the health of staffing companies while maintaining sustainable levels of business leading to increased wealth. So you're, Richard, do, do you want to direct that to someone? Um, I mean, I think uh, uh, maybe uh, first to Bob, just to get a point of view on that. Um, can I just um, new normal. cut across that? I saw Roger stick his hand up, uh, oh, sorry, Richard, and I was I... expecting that. So I think I should give way and let uh, Roger uh, oh, have thank the floor. You. Sorry, it was blocked from my view. Go on, Roger. I think thanks, um, thanks, Bob. Um, I think actually your your perspective uh, might be more relevant than mine uh, in some areas. Um, the the technology has been around to do this kind of stuff for many years, um, and working in the tech industry, this has been my norm for certainly over twenty years. Um, what's happened is we've had this catalyst for change, which has now made everybody have to consider ways of doing things that they didn't have to do previously, that overcomes the natural resistance to change. And, and in my day job, the biggest problem affecting any kind of transformation, uh, any kind of improvement in productivity is resistance to change. 
uh, based largely on that's the way we've always done it and you know don't feel inclined to try anything new and that's just human nature it's a, you know it, it runs through all of us at some level so what we've what we've got now uh, is people who are skeptical you know comments i've heard in the past like uh, well they can't work from home because how do you know the buggers are doing any work um, th those kind of issues have been shown to be false in, in and productivity has gone up in some areas we've had hospital consultants who you know, refuse to use technology on the basis that it would somehow devalue the patient uh, relationship, doing FaceTime uh, appointments, and guess what? Nobody's died yet. Um, yeah. So um, I, I think it, it, it's not a technological problem. The technology exists. We can deploy it uh, in many ways to improve and, and stop people traveling and reduce um, uh, emissions and all of those things. It's got to be driven by the desire to change uh, through the leaders of the companies and, and the bodies and, and, and so on uh, to, to make that willingness to change. And I think if that can happen, it could be good for everybody. Thank you. Can I add something to that, um, Richard? Yes, of course. Yeah, I think this will be the last one. Thank you. Sorry. I think this might be the last one. Right. Oh, well, maybe we um, perhaps have another question then instead of me again. Why don't we give it back to David? Okay, just one final question from John Andrews, okay, then, which is uh, uh, maybe a little bit contentious. Uh, is the media and its reporters or journalists acting in a balanced, unbiased and responsible manner in their coverage of the current situation? Go on then, Bob. I'll, I'll uh, give you a chance to answer that. <laughs> Why me? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it would be uh, wrong to categorise all, all the media as though they were uniform. I, I can think of one or two uh, people whom I will not name who do seem to me to have an axe to grind. Um, uh, but that I think most people can spot who they are. Uh, in general, are the media being fair, reasonable, uh, balanced? On the whole, I think so. I, I don't feel misled by the coverage that I'm seeing, whether television, papers, radio, uh, or online for that matter. Um, so, yeah, I think by and large, the media are doing what the media ought to be doing. That's my one-liner. Hmm. Thank you. Okay, so I think, you know, we come to the end of our um, discussion today and I really thank you for everyone who was able to attend and thank you again for those great questions. We'll circulate those around later on today. Um, so um, we will um, have another discussion and um, webinar in two weeks time at the same time on, on Thursday in two weeks time. Um, and uh, we'll start to sort of publicize that um, to sort of maybe pick up on one or two more sort of intricate points raised today. Um, and in, in addition, we'll, we'll do a blog um, um, based on today's conversation fairly soon to, to um, encourage, if you like, you to come on and comment on it. Um, but, you know, without further ado, we've come to the end of the time. Um, I mean, I, I certainly hope and I, I yeah, really thank you, all the panelists today, for your contribution. I, I certainly hope that um, the new normal, whatever the new normal is, will become a better normal. And, and I think it's up to us, all of us, whether we're still working, whether we're, we're retired, whether we're male or female, whatever. We, it's up to all of us to sort of have a debate, to have a discussion, to collaborate on our thoughts. And um, yeah, I, I'm sure we'll have a better normal coming out of this. It's too significant to just sort of go back as it was.